Uh, we're going to start now talking about what I think is the most critical part of progressive web apps. And that's really the ability to make them reliable and fast because instead of having to go to the network to get the resources that your app needs, they can get it from the local device, from the service worker. So my name is Pete. Uh, well, I guess I'll start here. My name is Pete. Uh, I'm a developer advocate on the Chrome team. Uh, I work in the New York office and uh, really excited to be here. This is my first time in China and I've loved every minute of it. So thank you for having us and I hope that uh, this is useful for you and you get to learn some neat new things. So I want to start with a little bit of a story. Um, let's say that I'm at a park and while I'm at a park living in New York City, uh, I humming along and I think, wow, hey, I really like this, this song that I'm humming and I want to record it so that I can try it later on my guitar. And so I open up my phone and I say, okay, I'm gonna go record it. I click on the little voice memo app up there and the voice memo app opens and wah, wah, it doesn't work, right? I get the offline dinosaur. Well, unfortunately, this park is in a cell phone dead zone where anything on the web just doesn't work. Even some native apps aren't gonna work. I can't get phone calls or anything like that. And this happens in more than just a park in New York City, right? This happens in places in a subway in New York or anywhere you can imagine where you don't have a good, solid, reliable network connection. And unfortunately, users expect their experiences to work reliably. They don't care if they're in a subway. They don't care if they're somewhere else. They expect their experience to always work. And we want to fix that. And this isn't always about the idea of a no connection scenario, right? Maybe you're on an airplane or you're in that dead zone. There's also that wonderful thing that we call Li-Fi, right? Because it's lying to you. It says, I have a network connection, but it doesn't, right? So it thinks, oh, I'm connected. I'm going to get something. I'm going to work. And it just sits there, and it spins, and it spins, and it spins. So because of this, we want to make sure that pages work even if they're not connected. So this is one of those things, even if you have four bars on your phone where it is connected, you might not have that live connection. So in order to become reliable, which is a key point of progressive web apps, is that they are reliable, we need instant loading and offline, all right? And we need that to come to the web platform. So Dion mentioned this earlier today, and I want to repeat it again because I think it's really important. If a user looks at a page and after three seconds it hasn't loaded, they're going to leave, right? So you're losing 53% of your users if they haven't seen something in three seconds. That's pretty, pretty drastic. And on top of that, we know that worldwide that over 60% of mobile connections are 2G. Now, many of us live in a big city and we're used to LTE, we have a fast connection at home. Yay, that's awesome. But not everybody has a fast LTE connection or a 4G. 60% have a 2G connection. And so we need to stop relying on the network and take that piece out so that we can become more reliable. Now, the key feature that we need for this is something called service workers. It's a relatively new technology. Um, it's a spec from the W3C, and it, it allows us to go and have these fast, reliable connections. Now, who here has heard or had heard of service workers before today? Put your hand up. Okay. Now, who here has heard of service workers since today? All right, cool. 
Sorry. Um, okay. So a service worker, as Dion mentioned earlier, is really sort of a client-side JavaScript proxy that sits on your phone. So it's pro a programmable network proxy that allows you to choose how you want things to work. But it's also more than that. When a page registers the service worker, it sets up a bunch of event handlers. So it listens for different events, for things like network requests, push messages, updates to the service worker, and so on. And because it's event-based, it doesn't take up any system resources. It's not sitting in memory. It's not doing anything. It's not using your CPU. It's just hanging out, chilling, just like. Until it gets a notification, or until it gets an event, and then it wakes up. So I'll say it again, because I think this is really important. It's not consuming any resources unless it's been woken up to handle one of the events. In fact, even if the browser is closed, so you don't have your browser open, it can still be woken up by the operating system. We're no longer limited to a model where the app has to be open in order to be functional. Right? You don't have to have a tab open in order for it to be useful. So this is important because it adds that app-like life cycle to your app. It means that our web apps can become much more functional and much use, more useful. So when a service worker is first registers, registered, it fires an install event. And that install event can be used to do things like prefetching a bunch of resources, your CSS, JavaScript, images, HTML, anything like that, and stores it on the device, caches it locally, so that the next time we need it, we can pull it right from the device instead of the network. Think of it as an install-as-you-go process. In effect, we're running a scriptable install process, much like a native app does. But there's no bulky zip files. There's no need for a, a store that we need to go upload our stuff to and have somebody go, yep, we approve this. Oh, we don't approve this. It just goes up on the web, right? And we have file level control over what is uh, cached. So we can say, oh, hey, I need to update this one file. We changed our logo. Or maybe it's, it's the holidays or it's something. We changed one color on one thing. We only need to update that one file. We don't need to update the entire thing. Then, once the service worker has been activated, we now have full control over the way that the system services your app's resources. We can look at the network requests and see what they are. We can go to the network and get a file and return that. Or we can get something from the cache that we've already cached. Or we can make something up. It's kind of cool. We have full control over how this all works. And all of this is transparent to the user. They don't see anything. The web just works beautifully and magically, like they're used to it working. In fact, a well-constructed service worker can function as a very smart caching system and be entirely transparent to the rest of your app. It's just a progressive enhancement to the network and cache. It gives you the ability to choose smarter ways to respond to requests. And the big thing is it makes our apps reliable because they don't have to depend on the network. All right. So uh, on the topic of service workers are a progressive enhancement, service workers really are for that second load, right? Because the first time the user comes to your site, the service worker isn't installed. It needs to get installed. So that first time, it's going to be just going through, going to the network to get all that stuff. The service worker really comes into play the second time a user comes to your site or once the user refreshes the page. So let's dive in and take a look at what the life cycle of a service worker looks like. 
So they translated our slides for us. So I hope that says service worker lifecycle, but I'm not really sure. So when the user first comes to the page, um, it registers a service worker with a specific scope. Now, I'll talk about scopes in a few minutes, but for now, think of a scope as the set of pages that the service worker is going to handle. So first thing that happens is an install event fires, and our service worker goes, oh, hey, I've got an install event. And it runs that code. Then the service worker goes idle. It just sits there quietly, right? Because like I said, it's for that second request. So now the service worker is there, but it's idle. It's just hanging out, not doing anything. Okay, so now the second time that the user comes to the page, so they've come to the page, and immediately the service worker goes, oh, hello, I'm awake. Let me help you with whatever you need. So then the service worker is ready to handle all of the events. At the same time, the browser makes an asynchronous request to the server to see if the service worker has been updated. Right, because we always want to have the latest service worker. Now, in this case, we're going to just say that the service worker hasn't been updated. It's still the same, nothing's changed. It's still the same service worker. And uh, so that's it. The service worker is activated. It responds to any events. Now, once the service worker has handled all the requests, maybe the user closes the page. Well, the service worker goes to idle, right? So it was, oh, hey, I'm up. And then it goes to idle, and finally it goes to terminated. It comes out of memory, so it's not doing anything. It's not taking up any resources. But it's ready to wake up or spin up again if any other events come in. All right. So let's talk about how you update a service worker, how the service worker gets updated. So much like before, the user goes to the page. Service worker goes, oh, hello, I'm activated. And it starts responding to events. And immediately, again, the browser checks and says, hey, is there an update for me? Has this service worker changed? And this time, because the service worker has been updated, we go to an install event and an idle event. But I want to point out one thing here. There are now two service workers installed. There's this one here, right? And notice it's idle. And there's this one here that's activated. So there are now two service workers installed. And this is important because what if we've changed something major in our service worker, but the user still has the page loaded with the old content? So this one immediately goes to idle and just sits there and hangs out quietly. It doesn't do anything. And the other one keeps handling any requests. Now, you can tell that second service worker to take control immediately if you want. And with uh, two APIs, one called self.skipwaiting and the other with self.clients.claim. But you should use those cautiously. So now, all right, this is one of those things that will bite you in the bum, to put it mildly. I've it's gotten me in trouble sometimes because you have a service worker and you go update it in your development and you're like, oh, hey, all right, so I made this change. Well, why isn't my new service worker running? Well, because you still have a window open and that other service worker will stay in idle until all of the windows close, until all of the other uh, browser windows using it have been terminated. So enough theory because theory is kind of boring sometimes. Let's take a look at how we actually would implement our own service worker and make this work. So first thing we need to do is register our, our service worker on our page. So w in your HTML, we're going to say if service worker in navigator. So that does the check to see if service workers are supported in the browser that the user is currently on, right? So Firefox, uh, Chrome, uh, there's a couple other browsers that have support for it. We only want to call this if the browser supports it, right? So check to see if it's supported because it's a progressive enhancement. And then we call nav navigator.serviceworker.register and we give it a link 
to the location where our JavaScript service worker lives. Then we can say, hey, you registered, um, or if not, if there was a problem, we'll go from there. Next, we need to handle the install event, right? That one bit where we're going to say, oh, hey, I've been installed. I maybe want to go pre-cache some things. So this is fired after the service worker has been downloaded and has been parsed. So let's start with something basic. Um, I've got self.addEventListener install. And this is just a very simple one. It doesn't take control of the page immediately, right? Because it will wait till the other things come in. And, but if we want it to take control immediately, right? We want that service worker to be in immediate control. We can do this uh, return self.skip waiting. That says to the service worker, hey, you, I want you in control right now. And that wakes that service worker up. So we're going to use the install event to prefetch the resources that we need and cache them in our local cache. So that way they're always there and available for us so that they can be loaded instantly and reliably. In effect, this install event handler is your opportunity to have a fully scripted install process. Like I said earlier, just like a native app. So here I've got, I've updated my install process and I say caches.open cache name. So I want to open a particular cache and I want to do it with a cache name because I want to version the files that I have. In case I've got multiple different things or I'm going to change something later, right? Having a version system is really important. So I'm going to open the cache and then I'm going to say return cache.addAll and I'm going to give it an array of files that I want it to go grab and cache. So I'm just going to say, hey, I want you to cache all of these things so that they're available anytime I want them. Now, in a real implementation, don't use this code because I'm not catching any errors, right? So you definitely want to put some error handling in here and do that kind of thing. So if something fails, you don't have a total, utter, complete meltdown, right? Now, finally, once everything has been added, we want to call self.skip waiting, right? That thing to say, hey, service worker, take over control right now so that any other requests that come through are handled by the service worker. Now, there's one other thing that I want to point out is that I've wrapped this whole code block in an event.waitUntil. The event.waitUntil tells the service worker, hey, I want you to go do some stuff, but don't shut down. Don't go to idle or terminated until after you finish this work, right? Because it would kind of suck if you were like, if you were to say, hey, go download these files. And then the service, wor the service worker starts downloading it, yay. And then all of a sudden it gets shut down, right? That kind of defeats the purpose. So event.waitUntil makes sure that our service worker wraps, doesn't shut down early. Then, once everything has been cached, um, our service worker goes into an activated mode. All right. So I like to use the activated event as an opportunity to clean up the cache. Is there anything in the cache that maybe from a previous version of the service worker that we want to get rid of or anything like that? So removing outdated resources. So here I've got my service worker dot add event listener, and I iterate over a list of the key names. So I do caches dot keys, which gives me the key names, and iterates over them, and checks to see if there's any in there that we don't want, and deletes them. So that way we've gotten rid of anything that doesn't matter anymore. Now there's one other thing that we want to do in this particular case, and that's calling uh, self.clients.claim. You can see on the very bottom there. And that tells the browser that we want this service worker to take control of any other browser window that uh, the service worker controls. So in this particular case, we're not going to worry about file versioning or anything like that. We want it immediately to start taking control. This only works if your service worker, if you haven't made major changes to, to your content. But at this point, if you were to go offline, 
wah, wah, you still get the dreaded dinosaur. We've cached all the files, the resources we need locally, but we don't have a way to get them out of the cache yet. So we need to do uh, an event handler to be able to do that. And we're going to use a, what's called the fetch event handler. So the fetch event handler works exactly like you think it does. Self dot add event listener. Uh, that self just refers to the service worker. It's kind of like this in the global scope, uh, but self dot add event listener fetch. And it listens for any network request, whether it's an XHR, an HTTP request, whatever, however you're out there trying to get the file, it sits there and goes, oh, hey, I'm going to intercept that before it goes out. And it allows you to do whatever you need. So in this particular case, we're going to say, hey, do we have anything in our cache that matches this request? So caches.match e.request, is there anything there? Well, if there is, let's return that. So it comes immediately from the cache. Didn't go to the network, it just pulled it straight out of the cache. But if it's not there, perform a fetch and just go get it from the network. So in this particular case, we've gotten the resources we need from the network or from the cache. So we now have an experience that loads almost instantly. Right? It's reliable because we've got all the resources we need on our device. Doesn't matter whether we're online or offline, it loads extremely fast because we've eliminated any potential network latency or network non-existence. Our last step is to let the page know that the service worker is registered and ready to go. Right? This is helpful to indicate to the user, hey, this app will work offline, or we're ready to work offline. Um, so in this particular case, I'm just going to, uh, I guess I won't show you that code, but you would just do some kind of little toast on the page. Now, earlier, I mentioned something about scopes. One of the cool things about service workers is that you don't need to register a service worker on every single page. You only need to register it once for a set of pages. Um, and, and anything within the scope that it was registered for will be handled by the service worker. Now, the easiest way to define the scope is simply where the service worker is served from. So in this particular case, I'm serving the service worker from the root directory, right? And that's where I recommend, very, very strongly recommend you serve your service worker from, all right? This means that every resource that is requested across my entire site will be served or will be handled by the service worker. Now, I made a mistake many moons ago when I first started playing with service workers. I put my service worker in a scripts directory because that's where you put your JavaScript files, right? Well, in this particular case, that means the service worker is only going to handle any files served from the service or from the from the scripts directory. And most of my app is not in my scripts directory. It's in the images, it's in the, the CSS, it's in the root folder, it's in all sorts of other places. So in this particular case, using the scripts directory, don't do that, all right? I beat my head against a wall for many hours because I couldn't figure it out. I don't want you to have the same problem, all right? So don't make the same mistake I did. Put it in your root directory, all right? So the magic of service workers is that you're in control, right? You can say, I want these things to be served in this particular way and how, it can, how it's controlled by the user. I've shown you a strategy called uh, cache first with network fallback, right? Because it went to the cache first to get the resource. If it was there, it returned that. If not, it went to the network. Um, it provides a nice, fast, reliable experience for users, 
but there are other caching strategies, and you're going to need to evaluate on your app which caching strategy you want to use. And you may need to use different caching strategies for different resources, right? So let's take a look at some of the different caching strategies. So cache, falling back to network. So this is the one that we saw earlier, right? Up to the network, oh, yep, okay, back. So network, falling back to cache. This one is kind of interesting. This one goes to the network first and sees if it can get there. Now, this is something you would use for very, uh, for data that needs to be always up to date. But there's kind of a bad piece of this in that the browser is going to wait 60 or 90 seconds for failure of the network before it goes to the cache. So in this particular case, it can be a frustrating experience for the user because the network takes so long. They don't see anything. So this one, use with caution. Cache, then network, uh, makes two requests. So it goes both to the network and to the, to the cache. The idea is to show the cached data first and then update the screen or update the user with the latest data, right? This one is really great. Think of this, most apps do this today. If you, you open up your app, it shows you the, the sort of last data it had, and then all of a sudden it, it shows you new data. So sometimes you can just replace the old data with the new data when it arrives. For example, a game leaderboard. But that can be disruptive for larger pieces of content, right? If all of a sudden you're showing a whole new series of news articles and the user was looking at a bunch at the top and all of a sudden you shoved them all the way down, that's not a very good user experience. So think about how you want to behave with the user experience in that particular case. The generic fallback strategy, a request is first made to the cache. Let's see if it's there. Nope, not there. Ah, let's go get it from the network. Oh, oh, okay, not there. So now we're gonna go to the cache and just get a generic response. This is ideal for secondary images. Think like a, a user's avatar, right? You try and get their, the user's image, well, get it from the cache, nope, not there. Get it from the network, oh, well, we don't have a network connection. Well, we'll just show the little blue head, right? That's the idea with there. My favorite use for this is there's a newspaper in the UK where if you try and go to their site and you're offline, instead of showing you the offline dinosaur, they give you a crossword puzzle to play. They give you a game. So you stay on their site. And then, once you get a network connection again, the site reloads and you're good to go, right? So they've kept you there and they've given you something fun to do. So this is a good use of the generic fallback. Now, the last one I'm gonna talk about is cache and network race. With some combinations of older hard drives, virus scanners, some mobile devices, and faster internet connections, um, it can the network can sometimes be quicker, all right? This is rare, but it does happen sometimes. So in this particular case, you wanna get whichever one comes first. If you don't really care whether you're getting the latest data from the network or something like that, this is a really good one to, to use in that particular case. Um, however, going to the network when the user already has the content on their local device means you're using extra network. Uh, data, right? And one of the cool things about progressive web apps is that they don't use all of your network. They're, they're much smaller in terms of size. Of course, there are a number of other strategies that you can use. Cache only, uh, where you just go to the cache. Network only, where you just go to the network. Service worker templating. I always mess that word, those three words up when I say them. Service worker templating, where you build your own content, right? So you take your HTML, you grab some data, put it together, synthesize your own response. But the point here is that with all of these different caching strategies, you are in control. 
you have the ability to choose how you want to respond with what particular data at what particular time. They're really powerful for this and allow you to really build a networked experience that is reliable and fast and consistent. It just works. Now, because you have so much control over the network, right, it can kind of seem daunting because, oh, all of a sudden, now you have an extra layer of cash, right? In the past, if you're testing something on, your, on, on a remote server, you might just be dealing with your local device. Maybe there's a proxy server somewhere up in the cloud that's, that's proxying stuff and caching some old data. Or maybe there's something somewhere else that's caching stuff and you're going, why am I getting the old stuff? Well, with service workers, there's even more of a chance of that happening. So the development can be a little bit annoying sometimes, but there are some good tools to help you build better uh, experiences. So we'll have references to these at the end of the slide so that you can uh, have a look at those. Um, so you don't worry about scribbling down uh, any of the URLs, or you can just go grab a screenshot that uh, like everybody's been doing that. So the first one that I want to talk about is Chrome DevTools. Um, Chrome DevTools have added a new set of tools to really help you dive in and understand what's going on in service workers. In the DevTools, you'll find this new application pane that allows you to see a number of things. So it lets you see what's going on on the manifest, uh, inspect the service worker, unregister it, you can force it to update, um, simulate offline behavior, and more. Now, I'm going to do a talk this later this afternoon on using these tools. I'm going to show you some uh, much more in-depth ex sort of examples of using them. Uh, but the Chrome DevTools is one really great place. Now, of course, other browsers obviously have a good set of tools. Firefox and Opera have a similar set of tools. I'll admit it, I work on the Chrome team. I'm going to show you the Chrome tools. But Firefox does have tools for debugging uh, service workers. So does Opera. Um, and I have no doubt that Microsoft will have some fantastic tools for debugging service workers when they ship service workers in Edge uh, in the near future. So that ability to be able to debug them is, is there. The DevTools not only allow you to inspect, uh, uh, let me try that again. The DevTools allow you to inspect not only things in your service workers, but also what's going on in the cache. So you can see what's been cached on the device. You can go understand, oh, hey, I thought I cached this. Oh, I cached an old, there's an old version, or maybe there's multiple versions, and when we try and request it, instead of serving the latest one, we're serving some previous one. So the ability to be able to go into the cache storage and see what's going on is really important and very helpful. Now, in the past, we used to tell people or recommend that when doing any work with service workers, you used an incognito window. You opened up the browser and you, you did your, your experiments, your tests, your, your development in an incognito window. And then you closed that window and you opened a new one and you did more tests. And the reason we said that was because when you close the incognito window, everything is deleted. Your service worker is, is blown away. Anything in the cache is gone. You're starting fresh every time. But there's a new tool that makes this much easier. In this application panel, you can go to this clear storage. And I know it's really low down here, but there's a button way down here. It says clear site data. I love that button. It blows everything away. I use it a lot. Um, that button will be probably your best friend as you're developing service workers. Um, we have, uh, if you go to the developers.google.cn slash web slash fundamentals, we have a uh, code lab that will walk you through some great tutorials on how to debug these. 
and you'll use that button a lot. It just blows everything away and means your service workers are gone, you can start fresh, you don't need to fight with anything. You won't bang your head against your desk, mostly. All right, so the next thing, we've got a couple of tools or libraries that you can use to speed up the development of your service workers. So the first one is Service Worker Toolbox. And Service Worker Toolbox is a library that comes with a number of pre-built caching strategies already implemented. So you can say, hey, I want these files to be network first, and I want these files to be cache first. And if you're familiar with Node.js and routing frameworks for URL interception, you're gonna be right at home with this because it provides a nice, easy level of abstraction. And you can just do a uh, search for this to find this. SW hyphen toolbox is the easiest way to find it. Here's how it works. In your Node.js, uh, um, let me try that again. So if you remember your cache first strategy earlier that we showed you know, with all that stuff where, hey, is it in the cache, is it there? That was a pain. This, we can just say import scripts, toolbox.router.get, anything, we just provide that URL, the, the um, wow, I'm totally messing, uh, a glow, uh, a regex, thank you. Okay, I'll try that again. Provide a regex with the URLs that we want and say, hey, I want you to go do cache first. The other one is something called SW Precache. SW Precache can help you by literally writing out your service worker code for you. Now, one thing that I will definitely say, using something like this is amazing and absolutely, this is the way that I would recommend doing it. When I showed you the code for writing your own service worker, there were some dark and scary corners that I didn't talk about. How do things get updated? How do things get versioned? How do you deal with Lots of files, right? In the way that I showed you, if you change one file, the service worker has to re-download everything, right? And that's kind of dumb. If you changed one file, you should only have to download that one file. So using these libraries are a good way to say, I just want to do, do it the smart way. Now, if you don't want to use these libraries, that's cool but just take a look at how they've implemented these things so that you can understand some of those dark, scary corners and you don't paint yourself into something bad. SW Precache is a node module that you can use in JavaScript uh, in, your, in your JavaScript build scripts. So if you're using Gulp or Grunt or something like that, you can use uh, SW Precache. Um, Here's how you would use your SW precache as a gulp task, uh, or in a gulp task. You just say, hey, write the service worker. I wanna precache the files that end in HTML and CSS, and I wanna runtime cache a whole bunch of other things. I wanna do fastest for one. I wanna do network first for some other things, and allows you to really just easily define everything right out of the box. So I hope I've given you uh, a at least a good introductory, introductory understanding of service workers and how they can be used to build those reliable, fast experiences so that your site works without having to go and fight with anything, so that it just provides an awesome experience. Um, we're gonna talk more about some service worker stuff because service workers power a number of other things throughout the rest of the day. Um, but this to me, if there's one thing you walk away from today with, go play with service workers. They're the coolest thing the web has done since Ajax, in my opinion. So uh, with that, I will say uh, thank you. Uh, and I think we will go to a couple of questions. Hi, Peter. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is you said uh, SW is supported by the OS, so 
uh, that it has the minimum version of an OS like Android. Uh, the second question is, uh, uh, can SW um, catch a response from an API like JSON? Yeah, okay. So uh, the first question was, what was the minimum OS that needs to support service workers? And that is, it really is just up to the browser. Um, that is the key thing that the browser has to support service workers. Um, so Chrome, I want to say it was mid-40s started supporting service workers. I don't know what version of Firefox, but it's f reasonably widely supported in the mainstream browsers and it's coming to other browsers. The second question was, can you make a, a cache or do anything with API endpoints? And absolutely. The fetch and cache will handle any HTTP request that you throw at it. So if it's JSON, if it's an image, if it's SVG, if it's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever you want, uh, you can do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the availability. So um, I want to know about this uh, uh, availability like um, is it available on Android, is it available on iOS, is it available on any like desktop browsers, uh, is it av available on Chrome or Firefox or anything. Yep. So and, and there is one important thing is that WeChat is very popular in China and the imp development for it is very important and yep. is it available within the browser of WeChat? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so where is uh, where are service workers supported today? So today, uh, the ones that I can confirm that I've tested myself, uh, Chrome, Firefox, Opera, uh, I have tried. Microsoft has said we are going to support this, so Microsoft in Edge will ship this. Um, Safari has given indications that they will support it, but they haven't said yes. They haven't given a timeline. So we don't know when, but we are pretty sure it's going to come. Please, please politely ask them to support it soon. Um, then uh, beyond that, uh, we have ha had discussions within the team with other browser vendors. They are looking at it. Um, the thing about service workers is they are progressive enhancements. So even if you go and build a site and a browser doesn't support it, the user will still get a good experience when they're online. When they're offline, they won't get it. The other, the sort of second piece of that, I would ask you to do the same thing that I asked you to do to Apple. Please go politely ask other browser vendors to support service workers because we need more, more folks to support this. I think we will see it. We just need uh, more folks like you asking for it and saying it's important. A quick follow up. So is it supported by the browser, not the system? It's, uh, it is a browser specific piece, yes. Uh, so it does, the operating system doesn't matter. So it, on Chrome it works on Mac, on Windows, on uh, Android, et cetera, yeah. Um, service workers seems to be a very cool thing. And my question was, can we use service workers with, uh, for example, PhoneGap or any other cl cross platform application development? And I have a second unrelated question. Does, if I use Google Chrome for development, is it that Google collects anonymous data about my usage of Chrome or thing? Okay, so first question. Um, wow, I just co totally blanked on it. First question, can you? <laughs> Hi, my name's Pete, um, whoops. Um, so my first question was, can we use, are these service workers available for oh, phone, phone gap, gap yes. or other? Uh, yes. So uh, can you use service workers within something like PhoneGap or other cross-platform uh, sort of frameworks? And the answer to that is maybe, but why would you? Because at that point, 
with PhoneGap or whatever that particular case is, you can already cache those within the app itself. The cool thing that service workers give you is the ability to say, I don't want to use PhoneGap. I want everything to just work offline. I don't want to have to go anywhere else for my user to get this. I just want to stay in, a, in the web platform. Uh, the second question um, about what is Google collecting on uh, when you're using Chrome, I, would, I don't know everything it does. There is a checkbox that says, hey, I want to send anonymized uh, usage data. You can uncheck that, and Google doesn't collect anything. Um, what it does collect, uh, I don't want to go into that because I don't want to tell you the wrong things. It's not collecting anything other than anonymized usage data. We don't want to know things like, are you using service workers? Are you clicking on that button, et cetera. Um, And uh, I think we will, I know we will run out of uh, time for questions. Uh, we do have the web booth, uh, and there are a bunch of us hanging out at the web booth. So if you don't get all of your questions answered today during the talks, please come and talk to us in the web booth or after the talks, between the talks. We would love to answer all of your questions. We just don't always have the time. Yes? Hi, please. This is Zalu from Microsoft. And uh, in your previous talk, uh, you have said uh, if the, if the uh, service worker is enabled in the browser, and all the ATP requests will go to the cache first, and then the internet, and your cache will be updated later, right? No, uh, that, sorry, uh, to be clear, yeah. that is up to you in your service worker how you want. So you have, in the service worker, when you capture that fetch event, mm -hmm. you can choose what you want to do, whether you want to go to the network, go to the cache, or whatever. That is that is totally up to you, how you respond to that. OK, I get it. And my last question is that uh, uh, since uh, some uh, ATP requests uh, can be uh, responded uh, within one second, for example, uh, could we? Uh, decide the caching strategy by uh, latency? By latency. Yeah. Um, you probably could, though essentially at that point you could just, uh, yes, you absolutely could. You could set a timeout in your service worker to say, hey, go get this. If you don't respond in you know one second, give this from the cache instead. So it could definitely define our customer's caching strategy. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, cool, the best thing about service workers, you are in total control. You get to choose exactly how you want. Thanks. Right. Last question. I heard from you that you recommend uh, the service worker script uh, are served in the root dictionary. Uh, that means I must have this rule. I, I have no choice to upload my service worker script uh, to the CDN, right? Um, Thank you. So you can technically put the service worker in any directory you want and force a scope onto it. So there's a number of sort of things that you can do to say, here, even though it's served from scripts, the scope is something else. So you can override where it's served from. But when you do that, you're, you're diving in deep to some sort of like things that are easy to goof up. So I recommend always serving from the root directory. Thank you. All right, so I think we'll wrap up. Yes, uh, we'll hang out. Uh, please come ask us questions. Thank you very much.